Tonight we have uh, Bill Keating. He is the incumbent Democrat in the 9th Congressional District here. And his challenger, Bill Sombrello, both in studio on probably the hottest day of the year so far. And of course, our air conditioning just conked out. So we appreciate you both being here and being able to keep your cool while we try to keep everybody comfortable. Now we say we usually do Monday night talk uh, on Monday night and do these forums. Excuse me, we weren't able to do that this time, but Peter Smith, who owns uh, the Plymouth Exchange and hosts the Antique Air Show, has graciously donated this time because he understands the importance of political debate. So the Plymouth Exchange is his store and the Antiques Air Show live Saturday mornings here, 10 to 11 o'clock, and we replay them on Wednesday night, 7 to 8. He always has a lot of really good guests. And thank you very much, Peter Smith. He features upscale quality 20th century designer and antique furniture, art jewelry, as well as an array of other rare objects of interest. And just from my own personal interest, my stife life, the lady that comes on and talks about the antique German teddy bears, that's my favorite guest that you have. But we have both candidates here in studio, and it is the 9th Congressional District. If you're not sure what the district is, and it is a big district, it's all of Barnstable County, Dukes County, and Nantucket County. The following municipalities in Bristol County. Acushnet, Dartmouth, Fairhaven, Fall River, Wards 1 to 3, Ward 6, Precincts A and B in Ward 4, Precincts A and B in Ward 5, New Bedford, and Westport. Here in Plymouth County, Carver, Duxbury, Halifax, Hanover, Hanson, Kingston, Marion, Marshfield, Metapoiset, Middleborough, Norwell, Pembroke, Plymouth, Plimpton, Rochester, Rockland, and Wareham, and the rest of the free world. No, I'm just kidding. It ended there at Wareham. <laughs> it just seems like that because it is a really large district, lots of uh, diverse population. Now, here uh, on our forum, we stick to the same format, asking questions along with me. I have Kevin Tachi. He, of course, the host of Monday Night Talk and also running cameras here for us because he's also part of Whitman uh, community access cable and this is going to be shown statewide and this can be uploaded through a special system to any other cable system in the state and Charles Mathewson from WATD as well. Now joining us tonight as always to time we have the lovely Amy Leonard there with the three pieces of construction paper red, green and yellow. Green means go, red means stop, yellow means you've got 10 seconds. I know there's different interpretations in Massachusetts, but we go with the basic stuff because we have limits here. Two minutes opening, one minute closing. Answers, we like you to keep it to a minute. If you go over a minute, you'll see me do a slow five count and then you're done. And that's what we end up doing. And we always have a good debate here as well. So we appreciate you joining us tonight. And what we're going to do, we pulled uh, earlier the order of the opening and closing statements. So we're going to begin with Bill Keating, Democrat here incumbent. Then we're going to go to Bill Cimbrello. And at the end, we will reverse that. So good evening. And let's start now with our opening statements. Let's begin with Congressman Bill Keating. Thanks for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you, Christine. And thank you for hosting this. And thank uh, WATD and thank all your listeners for uh, tuning in. Uh, I've been through that great district that you just talked about for uh, uh, so many uh, minutes, just telling how large it is. Uh, I've been through over a third of that just in the last three weeks, moving around while we're in recess in Congress. And I've got to tell you, the people I've talked to share my view that this is the most important election this fall uh, in my lifetime and many of their lifetimes, too, because our core values that our country is founded on are under attack. At a time in a way that they've never been before, uh, our freedom of religion, uh, our, the freedom of the press, uh, rule of law, uh, a failure of our checks and balance on the system, uh, decisions made by this administration and the House uh, Republican leadership that take away the ability of so many young people to aspire to greater things and take away the rights uh, that are there to protect our older citizens, our, their financial security, and importantly, a, a subject I hope we talk about here, their health care security. And all this is being done while, with the complicit uh, silence of the Republicans in the House. And uh, this election will give us the opportunity to put a check and balance in place where we can uh, have the oversight that we're supposed to have uh, under our Constitution by the House uh, and also by uh, having the ability of speaking up with solutions uh, to try and correct what's being done. So 
we look at this fall uh, as the most important time, uh, I think, uh, the most important election uh, in our country, and I'm excited about the opportunity of change in just a few weeks. Thank you very much. That was the incumbent. That is Bill Keating, a Democrat here speaking tonight. His challenger, Bill Sombrello, thank you for joining us here in studio. We'd like to hear your opening statement. Thank you for the opportunity, Christine. I appreciate it. On September 4th, the voters, the people of District 9, are going to have a choice to make between myself and Representative Keating. Both of us are Democrats, but we couldn't be any more different when it comes to our vision, our values, and where we would like to take this district, the Commonwealth, and our country. I want to talk directly to the listeners. This campaign is not about me. This campaign is about you. From day one, we've committed to the people of the 9th ninth District by saying we're going to listen. And in the last 10 months, we have been honored to be able to have conversations with tens of thousands of you. And instead of hosting high dollar fundraisers, we hosted meet and greets. Our campaign has been about relying, has not been about relying on corporate cash. Our campaign has been about directly connecting with you, the people. And we've listened. And at every opportunity, you've told us what you need instead of us telling you what we're able to deliver. And in that conversation, you told us that you wanted universal health care. You told us that you wanted the federal jobs guarantee and a Green New Deal in overwhelming uh, situations. The voters are yearning for a voice in our process that currently disenfranchises far more than empowers. People are sick and tired of the status quo that tells them that their ideas and dreams are too pie in the sky, too difficult, or too expensive. It's a single mother in New Bedford trying to feed her kids while working numerous full-time jobs does not want to hear it's too difficult. The fishermen and women of the coast don't want to hear that we have to uh, slowly transition off this dirty energy that threatens their livelihood every day. In this challenging moment in our nation's history, we really have to ask ourselves, if not now, when? The status quo has got to go, folks. Thank you very much. That was the opening statement of Bill Sombrello. Now we're going to go to questions. And if I was lax in mentioning this earlier, we have a round of questions from our reporters. And we will also have a lightning round tonight, which we do at every forum. And that's where we ask the candidates a question. And the answer is either yes or no. That's yes or no without an explanation or one or two sentences tops. And if we have time, sometimes we have candidates ask each other a question. Let's go to Kevin Tachi. Question for the candidates tonight here on the uh, forum here with the 9th Congressional District Democrats. Gentlemen, I would be remiss if I didn't at least bring up probably one of the top issues here in the Commonwealth and around the country, and that is uh, the opioid epidemic. What needs to be done on the national level? to deal with this problem and what needs to be done by your office and by other your colleagues in the Congress to be able to secure funding and uh, tackle this issue. I uh, will start with uh, Mr. Sombrello. Okay, Bill Sombrello, and then we try to keep your answers to one minute. Okay. Well, first and foremost, I think we need to decriminalize the uh, the uh, drug problem that we have here in, in the Commonwealth and, and nationally. Uh, the opioid ep epidemic uh, stems from a number of complicated issues. These are socio and economic issues, and we need to tackle this in, in a very uh, um, fundamental way way at the foundation and at the core. We have uh, physicians that in many cases have uh, prescribed drugs uh, irresponsibly, but at the same time we have to strike a balance between uh, controlling uh, the drug distribution and not punishing those that are um, in need of, of medication and pain medication. So there's a very fine line that has to be walked on that process and um, it all starts with uh, having compassion over the problem, decriminalizing it, and having, um, if, if necessary, uh, treatment centers uh, wherever they, they can be put. And they have to be accessible. We have some treatment centers, for example, in the uh, New Bedford area, um, but you know, there are bus stops away. So uh, we need to make them accessible. Thank you. Thank you. That was Bill Sumrella. Same question, Bill Keating? Correct. Congressman, same question. Well, thank you. And uh, this is an issue that uh, I've been involved in for over a decade and a half as a district attorney, I started the uh, opioid task force there uh, that was meant to deal with prevention. We saw people go from prescription drugs to addiction to heroin. Now we're seeing them go to fentanyl. Now we're seeing, uh, important for the people listening, 
uh, even cocaine uh, is laced with fentanyl. I've been involved with legislation to uh, particularly uh, with the VA to help them in terms of education of physicians. Uh, I've dealt with dual prescriptions so that doctors can prescribe Narcan with uh, opioid drugs for those people in long-term use, chronic kind of care. Uh, and I've also uh, <coughs> dealt with uh, allowing families to have that uh, kind of opportunity too that will save lives. I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I lost a family member uh, to opioid addiction <coughs> myself. Uh, and I've had so many friends, relatives, and others that have uh, lost lives as a result and had their lives changed as a result of this. And uh, it remains a problem, new challenges, but we're continuing to make advances. Okay, any follow-up questions? Yeah, I, I would say, what, what would you say during your time <laughs> since we've been seeing this over the past few years? What has been done um, on the federal level to tackle this? What have you been able to do? to be able to bring monies back to help, you know, to help with treatment centers for education, stuff like that. Congressman? Well, points here. I, I mentioned uh, what I've done in terms of uh, making sure that uh, opioid drugs can't be crushed or melted and taking them out. In fact, work to make sure the generic OxyContin wasn't allowed in the U.S. That was myself and a Republican, Hal Rogers, that did that. Uh, we're making sure that the education is there for people we're also uh, funding my amendments uh, to allow take-back programs. So there's grants federally for take-back programs so we can get these drugs out of the medicine cabinets as well. Uh, so these are just some of the things we've worked on, but it's been an area where I've worked across the aisle. It's important to mention that as, as well. I've teamed up with Republican members, and we have been successful on, on dealing with this. We have to do more because the landscape changes. Uh, I've dealt with interdiction issues. I, I sat down with the Homeland a person in charge of uh, stopping this in Hong Kong. Uh, I mean, I've done this from every possible angle because we're losing people every day uh, in this country, uh, and we can do more, and we have to do more. Mr. Sombrello, what are you aware of as far as what's been done on the federal level, and what do you feel needs to be done, whether it's education uh, or as far as treatment centers uh, needs to be done, not only here in our state, but also across the country to tackle this? What would you be willing to do to put forward legislation? Well, um, as, as you know, uh, or as, as many of our listeners may know, um, drug addiction uh, targets people of all ages and um, of all economic stature. Um, but largely, it does target the uh, more impoverished and um, so if we tackle poverty and if we tackle housing and if we tackle homelessness and we tackle job opportunities then it's a beginning uh, to tackle what is at the foundation at the root of these problems we can we can try and, and catch this at, at the back end of the process or we can try and nip this at, at, at the beginning before the problems ever start you know our, our government is great for throwing money at the end of a problem why don't we work to correct problems before they ever begin and that's what I would bring to Washington which is a proactive government rather than a reactive government okay. Charles Matthewson question for the candidates Guys, uh I hope we can avoid um, saying that we're Democrats and the Republicans are evil because I think you both are uh, convinced of, of that. So I'd like to get into some of the issues. Um, Bill Sombrello, you're in favor some of the issues that I think separate the two of you as Democrats. Bill Sombrello, you're in favor of single-payer health care. Um, how would you do that? Well, as, um, uh, you know, the Koch brothers um, commissioned a study here um, a couple of weeks ago with the intent to uh, squash single-payer health care. And lo and behold, the uh, study actually came out and showed that it would save $2 trillion. So if we look at the, the layers of bureaucracy and, of course, the ridiculous CEO pays that uh, we're seeing with the, within the insurance industry, um, you go into a doctor's office, there are four, three or four uh, clerical people. They're just trying to figure out what insurance plan... Uh, to, uh, to build to, there's this tremendous layering that doesn't need to be there. And if we, if we shorten that pipeline between the patient and the doctor, the savings are readily available. Okay, but how would you do it? How would you change from the private insurance system that we have now to single payer? 
and you know we we've all seen the uh, the layers of bureaucracy my wife is a nurse she spends more than half of her time with paperwork uh, we understand that but how in terms of politics do you get that done well so what many of us are talking about is an expanded Medicare for all system so it basically does it takes the existing system and, and does exactly that cradle to grave an expanded Medicare s system for all the politics politics of it is basically having enough people in Congress to have the backbone to say we're not going to defend the insurance industry we're going to just defend our constituency that's that's the politics of it and when the Democratic Party comes around to that way of thinking which is what I hear from my constituents then we're gonna have a system that works in this country that will rival every other uh, other nation but until that happens we're at the bottom of the pile Bill Keating and I find myself having to use your last name so we're usually more uh, informal here and just say Joe or Harry but there are two, two bills, bills here two yeah bills. so anyway Bill Keating uh, in health care you're very detail oriented uh, you want to increase funding for research at NIH, fight tick-borne diseases, etc. Would you support a sweeping change like the change to single-payer? Well, I, I think, you know, uh, Bill said at the beginning we have different values. I don't think we have different values on uh, health care in terms of we both would like to see universal health care access and affordability. Uh, but what we want in the future and what is the most we can do in the present aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, when someone calls my office and they're having trouble because uh, we've had a hem hemophiliac uh, par a parent of a hem hemophiliac child call up and say, my, my co-payments are a million dollars this year. Uh, when we have cancer patients saying, I'm paying 12000 a month. Uh, and when uh, with this administration, uh, since it's been in office, over 4 million people that had insurance have lost it. The tax bill has been rated as saying, 13 million people are going to lose their health care. You know, in Massachusetts, we were able to get uh, a health care system with only 2.5% uninsured. Uh, this can be done and we can move forward. But getting back to the opioid issue, because it's relevant here, doing away with the Affordable Care Act and the essential protections, they're allowing policies now in the market where that is not required to be paid for. Remember, too, if you feel like you didn't get in everything that you wanted to say during the uh, question and answer session tonight, you can always include that in your formal statement at the end. Charlie, was any follow-up with that? No, well, we're okay. okay. I, I want to get back. I want to talk a little bit more about the single-payer health insurance. All I know is over the years when, we, when we've had discussions with different, different people, different parties, all I know is my premiums keep going up, keep going up keep going up. We talk about Medicare, which seems a little bit more reasonable because I know what some you know, people that are slightly older than me, what they're paying. Watch so, it. Watch it. <laughs> so my question is, <clears throat> if if we do go to a single payer he health care system, which Bill, you, it's Bill Sombrella, which you had said was Medicare for all, who makes money on this and who loses money on a system like this? Is that a mm -hmm. question to me first? Mm -hmm. Well, so... Um, you know, this country has always gone through transitions, right? Um, back before um, we had uh, personal computers, we had uh, typing pools. I don't know if you remember th th those days. Mm -hmm. And um, but uh, you know, people have always had to reinvent themselves uh, as as the the nation advances and as industry advances. I've done that many times in my own life. And so there are going to be uh, opportunities that go away, and there are opportunities that are going to be created. And if you think about the fact that uh, when we expand to a Medicare for All system, we're going to need a lot more people to administer that on the back end, right? So not all these types of, not all the jobs that we're talking about that I mentioned in, in the doctor's offices, for, for example, necessarily go away. But to your point, we are paying ridiculously high premiums. It's not just the premiums. It's also the high deductibles. And um, um, uh, Rep Keating talks about protecting the Social Security um, but I'm out of time. Right. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another minute because I want, I want you to answer something specifically. Are doctors going to be losing money? Is this going to discourage people from going into specialty medicine, making, making the commitment to study for maybe an extra four years beyond medical school because they want to be, you know, an, a, a vascular surgeon because maybe they're not going to be paid as much? I'm just curious about how this whole pool of money is going to be distributed. Well, so... 
one of the things uh, that we have to look at is is the um, the insurance that doctors are having to pay. Malpractice insurance is out of control. So um, there's there's a lot of ways that that uh, we can address the issue with with the doctors. Doctors need to be worried about medicine. They need to be worried about um, providing services that that um, that are important to the, to the patients and not over testing, not over prescribing, not running a CAT scan for a broken toe. I mean, all these things go away if we have a system that is actually designed to treat the patient. And I uh, and I'm sorry if I'm talking around your your question, but at the end of the day if we simplify it and we make again physicians focus on being doctors then I think physicians will want to uh, stay as physicians and do well. Okay let me ask you one more follow-up question so a guy, a, somebody who wants to be a man or woman who wants to be like a, a pulmonary specialist sure. are they going to make over 250 300 400 thousand dollars a year to pay off their medical school bills within the first couple of years or is that gonna is that dynamic going to change it, it in my vision of of, of, of a universal health care mm -hmm. system system or uh, Medicare for all no I think the earning potential is the same for a physician what it does is it, it, it shifts those dollars from having to go in other areas okay same question, Bill Keating. What do you think? Do you think somebody's going to make money and somebody or some industries are going to lose money in a, in a Medicare for all type system? Do you agree with that? Well, the savings will be wrung out of the administration. There won't be that middle profit area where insurance companies that are administrating things are extracting profits. That's where the savings will be going in that direction. But uh, we also have to deal with the present. I deal with the present when people call my office and people are in trouble. And it's important to note that with the Affordable Care Act, that the 2% increase across the board, according to Kaiser Health Services, who study these things, that's the lowest increase in half a century. So we were extracting savings. Massachusetts was, I think, the model for the country in this regard, not only with just 2.5% of the people uninsured, but they were moving the cost in great areas. Community health centers right here in Plymouth County have been opening. They're 24% less expensive to run, and they're accessible to people, and those things are being attacked right now uh, with a budget <coughs> that's going to cut Medicaid that funds 38% of those community health centers uh, by this administration uh, being cut by $1.5 trillion in Medicaid alone. Thank you very much. That was Bill Keating. Let's go back to Kevin Tanchi. Questions for the two candidates here. You're listening to a political forum. It's the 9th Congressional District. We've got the incumbent, Bill Keating. He's a Democrat. His challenger here for the Democratic primary, Bill Cimbrello. And this is being sponsored very generously by Peter Smith and the Antiques Air Show. Kevin Tachi. We've talked opioids. We've talked health care. Um, I think immigration also ranks up there as one of the top issues. What do you stand on comprehensive immigration uh, reform and a pathway to full and equal citizenship? Uh, Congressman? Well, thank you. Uh, Great question because uh, three years ago, uh, and we're talking about uh, the passing of John McCain, who was one of the sponsors of this, but three years ago the Senate passed by, uh, I think, over a two-thirds majority bipartisan support for comprehensive immigration reform. What happened when that hit the House? Nothing. No action. It never hit the floor for action. And I'm convinced, sitting in that House, talking to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, that would have passed. But it wasn't even allowed on the floor because of a minority of the majority party, the Freedom Caucus, stopping that. That's one of the problems we're dealing with now. DACA, if it was on the floor right now, would pass overwhelmingly. I would guess over 70% of the people. It hasn't passed because it hasn't hit the floor. That's why we have to change the leadership this fall. Because I'll guarantee you, if the Democrats are in power and, and leading the House, those things will come up for a vote. That's democracy. People can vote against it. But I know that if it hits the floor, these things will pass. But the, the, the Democrats have had their chance under Barack Obama. Uh, when you had the House, you had the Senate, to, to, and you passed health care reform, ACA. Um, why was it something done in regards to immigration reform? It just seems that it's a back and forth, a volley between the Republicans and the Democrats where nobody wants to get anything done. And, I, and the finger pointing is every time we speak to you know folks who are elected, they want, to, they want to blame the other side. If we had the numbers, we'd be okay. What needs to be done collectively? Not if there's the Democrats or the Republicans. What needs to be done collectively? I, I, I just, you know, what I just said is pretty clear. That the Senate voted in a bipartisan way to Let's do it three years ago. 
the House is prepared to and it would pass, okay. uh, and they just won't have a vote on this. So what is going to change? You know what stops finger pointing? Putting bills on the floor, letting democracy happen, letting the votes occur. Then you know where your, uh, your representative stands. I'll tell you this, there's two, only a couple of reasons why uh, leadership wouldn't put something on the floor for a vote. Number one, they'd be afraid it might pass. Uh, or number two, they were afraid that some of their people uh, would take a vote that was unpopular and hurt them for their re-election. And comprehensive immigration reform and DACA, uh, continuing TPS for those countries that are still unsafe to go back to, those are overwhelmingly popular. And important to our economy, by the way, comprehensive immigration reform will cost us a trillion dollars in lost revenue to our economy over the next 20 years uh, by not moving forward uh, on it. And that's why even very conservative groups like the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce joined together uh, in supporting this. Mrs. Sombrello, same question. Comprehensive immigration reform. Where do you stand on it? What needs to be done to, to, to make this happen? Right. Well, first of all, I want to take uh, Mr. Keating back. He says he deals with the present. But, uh, in fact, his policies and his voting record actually show that he's uh, been voting to keep us in the past. And I think it's time for us to radically move forward and, uh, and do something that's going to change the direction of this country. Um, I think he's a little bit hypocritical when he talks about he's been defending the Democrats. He actually voted uh, with the Republicans at a time when he could have voted to defend DACA. He voted uh, with an economic bill with the Republicans. So it's disingenuous for the, uh, uh, Rep Keating to say that he's all for DACA. Um, then... Uh, are you, gonna, are you going to answer the question that Kevin I, asked you? I, I am. I, I've, 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 also, um, I, I've also related to that. Um, I've openly stated that I would work to abolish ICE. Um, I, custom enforcement I would keep, but we didn't need ICE uh, uh, 15 years ago. Why do we need ICE now? Um, we need to have comprehensive uh, immigration reform, and we need to uh, act on that, and we need to get people out of the shadows, not put them into the shadows, and make them uh, contribute to, the, to, to our, our tax system. If I could, yeah, 30 it's, seconds. I've got to tell you, uh, uh, anything that included DACA would have set immigration and fairness back. So if you want to support what was in that bill that the Republicans put forward, then you're not for uh, immigration reform. I've even voted to discharge, a petition to discharge the DACA, clean DACA bill to the floor for a vote. And Republicans joined with us. We were two votes short when the leadership put their hand down, the Republican leadership, and stopped it. So uh, if you want to support that bill that included that, then you are taking immigration backwards. Don't cherry pick a bill. Uh, deal with the facts of the bill, and if you want to defend it... We'll have it, a chance for you folks to ask each other a question. It'll be fine. So, uh, Charles Matthewson, questions for the candidates. Bill Sombrello, in addition to single-payer, you propose abolishing ICE, as you just said, a federal jobs guarantee for everyone, taking foreclosed property by eminent domain to turn it into affordable housing, requiring, requiring biometric trigger locks on guns. Do you risk being minimalized on the left, like the Freedom Caucus is minimalized, uh, marginalized on the right. Look, let me let me flip that around. What what? Think, let's talk about what we risk if we don't do these things. We have incredible homelessness going on right now. We have veterans that are committing suicides to the tune of 22 a day on average. We have people living on the streets in the aisleways under overpasses. And it, you, you know, <coughs> let, let's talk about what needs to be done and why it needs to be done. Look at look at the heinous uh, crimes that have been happening with with guns in, in the wrong hands. We have children that have uh, accidentally killed themselves, killed their, their friends. We need to have a system that addresses uh, uh, gun control in a way that, that works uh, so that people that want to have guns for sport can certainly have access for all that, but we definitely have to have responsible policies. And so all these things that I'm talking about, uh, you know, they need to be done. We, we can't keep kicking the can down the road here for what needs to move the nation forward. But in terms of practical politics, again, uh, <coughs> these are <coughs> very, whether we agree or don't agree, they're very left uh, trending ideas. Uh, you've, you've called yourself a democratic socialist. Um, do you give up power in the House and 
be shuffled over to the margins uh, if you uh, on the left, just as the Freedom Caucus has been on the right. I, you know, I, I don't think so. The country, the voters are telling us, look what happened in Queens and New York. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she's, she's a staunch progressive. We have many of the very uh, similar policies. Look at Bernie Sanders. We have similar policies. I think you know, it's time for, for everyone to realize the voters, the electorate, want different policies than what Congress is producing. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a, uh, a, a, a record that the, the, the people are saying that, that they're only getting a 10% uh, job approval rating or sometimes in the single digits. You know, let's, let's stop worrying about, you know, moving to the left, moving to the right. I'm moving towards the people. That's where I'm moving. Bill Keating, is politics um, solely the art of the possible? Do you remember your youthful idealism when, well, you, when uh, you had all of you here. You do, evidently, and I appreciate the thought. Uh, <laughs> although, I'll tell you, it was a little cooler today uh, yeah. <laughs> with less hair. Uh, <laughs> I haven't lost a bit of idealism, and that's what fuels me. Uh, and I'm not afraid to take on tough fights. I think you're referring back uh, when I took on the challenge uh, in my own party. Uh, you know, it's interesting. People are saying we need change. Uh, how many people take on the, the powerful leadership in their own party and take them on? I did that in the state senate when I took on Bill Bulger, and, and I'm not afraid to do it here as well. It's what moves us forward. Uh, and I've had great disagreement uh, with my own party uh, on things, and, and that's healthy. But back to your question uh, to my opponent a minute ago, you cannot become so ideological that you can't realize that being effective in a legislative sector you know, setting in Congress, it's about relationships. I have teamed together with Texas Republicans on so many issues that are so important to our country right now, and we work together. So you pick those opportunities and work together and not build a wall around yourself where you're boxed in uh, by some kind of ideological barriers the way thank the Freedom you. Caucus thank does you. in the Republican side. So okay, thank any you. Any follow-up? Hmm? Bill, I was looking through some of your, uh, Bill Cimbrello, I was looking through some of your uh, uh, issues with your campaign, uh, and one of them was canceling college debt. Do you mean restructuring debt that kids owe or just completely wiping it out, and who would make up the difference? So 90% of the college loans that are uh, outstanding right now are government guaranteed. Um, just like the government can make a choice to uh, spend $717 billion for the military industrial complex, mm -hmm. they can just as easily forgive that debt. And doing that would inject an enormous amount of money into the economy. Uh, I, I, as I walk around the district, time and time again, I hear about parents and grandparents that, are, that are, uh, have re remortgaged their home to pay down uh, debt um, uh, for their college uh, kids that can't afford to, uh, to pay it because they can't get good jobs. So, you know, uh, on the one hand, we're promising that we're going to um, uh, protect Social Security, but on the other hand, we're, we're taking the money out because people are, are having to dip into their retirement funds. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. We have the way to do that, and, um, and it needs to be done. Do you know collectively how much that amount would be, roughly? Well, it's 1.5 trillion, of okay. which uh, of which two thirds of it is uh, undergraduate, and the rest is is graduate. And the graduate studies, I am a little bit more flexible on because I, I think if you've elected to go to graduate school, I think that's a different, uh, maybe a different uh, way that needs to be handled. You wouldn't think maybe there would be some kind of a middle ground where people would learn to be responsible for something that they agreed to take on, and now it's just wiped off the wiped off the planet. You just get rid of that debt. Well, let's talk about how we got here. When I went to school, a semester cost 300. Uh, 300 a semester at UMass Boston, okay? It's radically different now. Um, we're talking thousands and thousands of dollars later, even books at a ridic ridiculous cost. So it, it's a d very different parameter, and wages haven't kept up with that, mm -hmm. all right? So we've got schools that are for profit, for their profit, not for the profit of the graduates. Mm -hmm. And we've got, to get, we've got to get our education system back to where it's providing a service, not a profit. You don't think people should be responsible for, pay for paying at least some of that debt that they agreed to? I mean, it wasn't a surprise. They knew what they were getting into. And a lot of other people in former generations, whether it took them 20 years, they paid it. Well, what, I don't know if you realize there's, there's people in their 60s um, that are carrying college loan debt ev even now. I think the, the number is like $68 million mm -hmm. in college loans. So uh, we've been carrying this debt around, and I want to look at it a, a different way. Mm -hmm. we, we, we know trickle-down economics doesn't work. 
Okay, it, there, all the evidence is there. We've cut 1.5 trillion coincidentally, the same number in, in the GOP tax scam. It doesn't work. They're buying back. They're buying back uh, their stocks, and they haven't given it any a, any raises. If we inject this money back into the economy, people are going to be able to buy cars. They're going to be able to buy a first home. They're going to be able to buy durable goods. They won't have to live at home with mom and dad. That is huge. So, you know, you talk about being responsible and all the rest of it. This is this is a, a lifesaver to the economy. So let's look at the big picture. Let's not get tied up in oh I I I didn't have to pay why you know I had to pay my way. Why should why should you, or why shouldn't you? Okay. What about you, Bill Keating? What do you think? Think all college debt should be wiped out, or people should maybe get it restructured, maybe be required to at least pay a portion of it? What kind of a message do you think that's? I realize times have changed, uh, but you know, uh, <clears throat> for my undergrad at BC. Uh, and my master's in business. Uh, I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I loaded trucks at 5, 5.30, uh, earning my way through college, uh, working uh, my senior year, uh, you know, 50 hours a week and taking daytime courses. I was fortunate to, to be able to have that opportunity and to use that to pay uh, my entire college tuition. Things have gone up since then, and they're a problem. And I know how tough it is. I just, my wife and I uh, sacrificed for decades putting money away for our own children and, and their education to help them go forward. Not every family can do that. However, to forgive everything, put this in perspective, if you take every debt of every credit card for every individual in the United States in America, every company, and added it all together, what's owed on college debt is more than that. Think of the magnitude of that and how feasible that is. It's not. But I've worked to make sure that sponsoring bills that would allow them to renegotiate the cost down, support Pell Grants, and look at what we've done in Massachusetts with the UMass plan. 30000 And I'm going to ask you a follow-up, because I did ask Bill Cimbrello a couple of follow-ups with that. So what would you, what would you do to make Good. it more make Thank it you. more feasible to say a 22-year-old kid, they're getting out of school, you hear these kids, I mean, they owe tens of thousands. Some of these kids owe over, over a hundred thousand dollars in debt. So, right. what, how do you, how do you handle that? I had uh, uh, you know people that work for me in the DA's office uh, that owed that kind of debt. You know, struggling to get forward. Listen, uh, one thing we can do in Massachusetts, we had a great plan. The U, I began to say the UMass plan. Uh, you could go uh, four year tuition, two years. Uh, you know, for a community college, two years for four-year college. The total tuition of that's thirty thousand. These things can be done, and that's a great model to to do. In the meantime, we can make sure that they <coughs> can renegotiate the interest rate. We, th these kids shouldn't be paying six percent interest rate on something. The government shouldn't be making money on it, and we should do Pell grants. We should also not have government reward uh, colleges. Part of the criterion, and Obama started this. That in terms of federal aid to colleges should include what the tuitions are. What are they doing to hold those tuitions lower? These are all things we can do in the present uh, to move forward. Okay, thank you. Let's go to Kevin Tauchi. Questions for the candidates? Knowing that we have limited time, I mean, there's, there's so, many, so many issues, whether we want to talk commercial fishing, talk about rising seas and seawalls. I'm sure we'll get to that somewhere down the road. Let's talk a little bit about uh, violence, gun violence. Uh, we continue to see the loss of lo innocent lives just this past weekend mm -hmm. down in Florida. Another incident at a, a video game, um, a get-together. Uh, lives were lost. I guess what I want to ask you, in your opinion, is the federal government doing enough to create stricter legislation? Are there existing laws that need to be amended? Better enforcement of the current laws? Or is this an issue that should be dealt with by the individual states? on the local level. We'll start with the congressman. Congress uh, has been neglectful in this regard. Uh, I sat with victims as a DA, victims of violent crimes, victims of gun violence, and to a person, the only thing they have asked us to do is don't let this happen to anyone else. <coughs> and I'm committed to doing that. Uh, I, I've co-sponsored legislation that will make things safer, strengthening background checks, uh, uh, banning assault weapons, banning magazines, that, that are unnecessary, uh, bump stocks being banned. These are all things that there's a great agreement with. Once again, if this was put in the House floor for a vote, so many of these things would pass once people are accountable. The NRA is using their influence against this. And I'll tell you this, in Massachusetts, uh, the NRA has spent more money against me than every other member of the delegation combined because I haven't just been silent about this. 
uh, I've been a leader and outspoken on these issues. And, and I think the vast majority of Americans agree with that. Well, just like the opioid epidemic, it isn't just the opioids anymore. You get the fentanyl, you get the car fentanyl. Same thing with with uh, the gun violence. Now, the, new, the latest thing is, is a, th- a 3D printer. Uh, do current laws prevent these weapons or the blueprints being able to fall into the wrong hands? If not, well, what needs to be done? Well, uh, certainly I joined other people in trying to prevent that from occurring. It was uh, uh, part of a settlement by the administration uh, on a case, uh, but it made no sense. Uh, it was out there. Once it's out there, I guess it, 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 you know, it's something that can be used. But it's one example, again, uh, of not using common sense uh, when it comes to, to people's safeties. You know, one of the examples that shows the extreme nature of this is uh, people that are, are banned as suspected terrorists uh, on airplane flights, no fly list. They can legally get a gun and explosive still uh, in this country. It's that extreme in, in the protection uh, that, did, that denies common sense. Mr. Sombrello, uh, same question, uh, and uh, if you want, I can repeat the question, but again, uh, and then I'll, allow me once you've finished that, I'll ask you the follow up. Sure. No, I, I understand the question. Um, uh, generally speaking, on, on many of the points, uh, uh, that Congressman Keating did make, I, I am in agreement. However, uh, once again, uh, Congressman Keating is treating the problem at the back end. Uh, we have a lot of gun violence that starts out with a mental health issue. And we need to have uh, a robust, uh, again, universal health care system in this country that addresses that. My uh, gun platform actually includes a two-year renewal procedure that would require a, uh, a health a mental health check basically on the individual it, it would also allow family members and or others to report anyone that is suspect of not being shall we say qualified to own a firearm um, uh, my legislation would include a um, uh, a, a chain of custody data, which the NRA currently is fighting strongly against, uh, and the, and closing the uh, the gun show loophole. So again, um, I I want to be uh, uh, proactive, not reactive. So my follow up question: okay. uh, being able to manufacture a gun using a three D printer, and also as far as uh, blueprints uh, to be able to do this. What's your thoughts and about about this information, this technology? falling into the wrong hands. Sure. Um, So even a a 3D printed gun needs a bullet. So one way to manage that is to uh, really get really stringent at the point of the ammo shops when people go and buy ammunition for these guns. Uh, Are you going to stop every uh, occasion? No. And I don't think there's anything that that anyone can do that is going to cover every possibility. But that's certainly one way that that can be managed. Okay. Charles Matthews in question for the candidates. Bill Keating, your opponent here accuses you of promoting a war-based economy. Do you? Absolutely not. Uh, And I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, If he wants to tell a few minutes. I've I've read uh, some things he said that I'm supporting more armaments in North Africa. More Where that came from is beyond my imagination. It doesn't exist. So uh, I don't know where that comes from. I don't know what he's citing. And it'd be interesting as we're here in a debate to see him tell me where. Where did that come from? Why are you saying that when it's not true? Well, do you want to ask, we want to switch now and ask each other a question? Well, ask him a question, then Bill no, can I ask you a question. Might, yeah, I might okay. want another one, but that's okay. all right. Okay, go <laughs> right. So, so we're moving into this phase? No, yeah, well, let's do that right. Let's take a little break sure. and let's do that. You can ask a question, let Bill answer. So uh, you're telling me you did not co sponsor a Republican bill? Uh, that would move uh, that that would move troops into uh, North no, Africa. No, absolutely not. Well, I, so wh- why did you say? Where did it come from? Where did, I, where did, I, where did I, you base I, that on? I saw your it. imagination. What did you see that doesn't exist? Okay. So what did you see? I saw that. And then what did, we did, are excited because what do you want me to do, pull out a laptop here? So the no, I want you to tell the truth. That does not exist. Really. And you've been going around telling people and that. You and, and, you, and you didn't vote to also upgrade the nuclear arsenal. I did what we had to do in terms of what Obama did and everything because it wasn't safe to be there. Now you're switching the topic because you're not answering my question. No, if you're asking me about being a hawk. No, if you ask me about being a hawk. No, I asked you about just what just you said. The first question if you're running for Congress, be Africa. be responsible. How dare you have a charge on something as serious as putting young people's lives in the line? I come from a gold star family. I don't take that decision lightly at all. 
and you were so irresponsible, and you're here tonight saying you don't have proof of something because there is no proof. Well, I where, where did that come from? I don't have the I don't have the bill in front of me. I do not. It doesn't mean it doesn't That's exist. That's because it doesn't exist. Well, I, 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 can't, I can't say that. Well, I can because I, can, I know every bill I co-sponsored. Yeah. Okay. Now, Bill, you have a question for Bill Simbrella. Do you have a question for Bill Keating? Well, I'd like to know how, how uh, Rep Keating is going to walk into the district and, and uh, tell the people that uh, are dying because they can't get treatment, they can't pay for treatment, they can't pay for... Um, they can't pay for treatment or uh, the, the high deductible. How are you going to tell them that, on the one hand, you're protecting Social Security and you're going to make sure it's properly indexed and putting $5 in their left pocket while you take $10 out of their right, again, on the issues that we talked about, which is college education and this, this, this cra crazy so-called Affordable Care Act. It's disingenuous. These things are all connected. They all bleed into the same economy. So either you, 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 you take a holistic approach you take a holistic approach to solving these problems. What is the question? Yeah. What's Thank the you. question? The question is how 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 is he going to address single payer? He talks about okay. uh, he talks about that that he's for it suddenly. Okay. This this is a new change in the All last right, so forty eight hours. The question is how are you going to address single payer? Well, I think we address it in the real world, and, and that means that's something to aspire for, it's something to move for, but you have to have the ability to do it and make it function. Now, the interesting thing with Social Security is we have vetted a plan that will move uh, the funding of Social Security into the next century. For those people listening that are 40 and 50 and paying into this, so many of them say, when I'm never going to see it. Why am I paying it? This takes care of that. It also allows for a cost of living. We put some practical things in, too. In, in our area, there's a real shortage of seasonal workers. And one of the things, so many people that are on Social Security want to work a little on the side, supplement their income. But it's never been changed, so it's like $25,000 limit before you tax. We double that so that that'll happen. There's a lot in it. And one of the things I hope we do uh, when we get the House back in the majority of Democrats is put this on the floor because it will pass and it will. there are solutions to these difficult problems. Okay. Kevin Tachi, did you have a question there? <laughs> no, I, I did not have a question. I was just saying something okay. to Charlie. Okay, because what I'd like to do is... Side chat. This is, you know... May I ask a, a, may I ask a qu quick follow-up question yes. since you talked about the seasonal okay. workers? One minute. Uh, answer, Bill Keating. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I'm cognizant of being a, a business owner and what's going on uh, on the Cape, because it is seasonal, the state unemployment insurance, um, unless your business is only operating 10 weeks a year, uh, many of the business owners are, are getting hit with an 11.1% or so uh, state unemployment insurance. That's a huge chunk of change for, for business owners. Um, and I'd like to know um, how the congressman is going to address that to, to, to make it uh, viable and also uh, what he would do to take some of the ebbs and flows out of the seasonal business that we talk about. Uh, I, in my case, of course, have the federal jobs guarantee, but I'd like to hear the co congressman's uh, take on, on those okay. issues. One minute, please. Well, I'm not going to address state issues because uh, we're not running for state office. We're running for federal office. But uh, I've been the leader in our area, and if you talk to uh, the businesses on Cape Cod, uh, the Chamber of Commerce on Cape Cod, I've worked hard to get the H-2B program in place the way it was under President Bush, the way it was under President Obama. But Stephen Miller and the uh, Trump administration have warped the ability to use this in some way tying it to immigration when it's really a small business issue. Uh, and I've been a leader. I put a coalition of 89 congressmen, both sides of the aisle, together to work to this. But one of the surprises I had when uh, President Trump was elected, I said the, the issue I won't have to worry about anymore is the H-2B issue because he uses them lavishly in his own business. Yet his administration has thwarted the ability uh, to deal with the demand in this program the way that both President Bush and President Obama did. So I'm a leader on this. I'm proud of it. I'm going to continue to work. It's part of knowing the district and the needs of your district. Okay, if you want to ask Bill Cimbrello a quick question in one minute, and then we're going to have a quick lightning round of final statements. Bill Keating, do you have a question for Bill Just Cimbrello? Just a, a quick question, I guess. Uh, Christine, you've raised and uh, other and Charlie raised issues about the things that Bill wants to do, and, and his values are, uh, are great in that respect, but actually doing it is difficult. So one of your solution is to print more money. That's how we're going to pay for all of this. That's what you said. I'm not exaggerating it. It's not hyperbole. It's on your website. You said it. So tell us how printing more money is going to be the solution to funding all of the things you talked about. 
I'm so glad you brought that up. Nowhere do I say printing more money. And let's let's be clear about how the government funds itself. We have a sovereign currency, just like the government decided that it could afford to cut 1.5 trillion in taxes to the richest Americans in the country. At the simultaneously, virtually, it it uh, uh, approved a 717 billion dollar military budget. Did your taxes go up? No, no one's taxes in this room went up. So the, 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 the money is coming from Congress when Congress allocates that funding through the Fed and tells the Treasury to move money into the appropriate accounts. There is no printing of money that takes place. And in the history of this country, every time we try to balance the budget, guess what? We go into some form of a recession. So I think if you're, I don't know if you call yourself a budget hawk or a budget dove, but I think it's disingenuous to tell the people in this country now that we can't, we can't have one thing without the other. Okay, what we're going to do now is go to a quick lightning round, and lightning round is, <clears throat> excuse me, is either a yes or no answer or one or two sentences tops, then we'll go to closing statements. Lightning round questions for the candidates. Kevin Tauchi. Yeah. When it comes to national politics, is there such thing as a middle ground to negotiate policy and legislation? Or is that what's lacking in our nation's capital these days? One to two sentences, Christine. Okay, you, let's start with Bill Cimbrello. So uh, I think every time uh, the Congress has moved to the middle ground, the people of this country have lost ground. So uh, I would say middle ground is... Uh, the killer area. Okay. Bill, Bill Keating, same question. Yes, and, and if uh, bills come to the floor and they're actually voted on, people will be accountable and you will see people come together for solutions. Okay, Charles Matthewson, lightning round question for the candidates. Bill Sombrello, what are your top three news sources? Um, I would say most of, mostly it's internet based. I don't pay a lot of attention to mainstream media because I find it uh, uh, clouded with uh, corporate interests and um, so, you know, um, I would say, uh, uh, boy, uh, Truth Dig, for example, would be one. This uh, is lightning rounds. Keep it lightning. Yeah, um, yeah, they're not coming all to mind right now. I'm blanking okay. out. Okay. Uh, yeah. Same question, Bill Keating. Interesting. Uh, being a member of Congress is like getting a PhD on information thrown at you. Uh, it's incredible to be a member of Congress. We get so much information that's Three top sound. sources. Uh, and... Uh, I read you know, five papers uh, every morning, uh, national and regional. This is why we can never do the lightning round. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two sentences. Keep the IRS the way it is or completely revamp it. Bill Keating. It's been hollowed out right now. We're dealing with constituent complaints. There's no one there. They have, this is, I'm sorry to extend it, but it's almost <laughs> funny. I got to tell you. They have a, what they call a courtesy cutoff now. When people are waiting two hours to get an answer to something, they cut you off as a courtesy. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> Phil Cimbrello, you know, got the IRS to redo it. What do you think? Two sentences. Well, I think it needs to be revamped, just like the code needs okay. to be revamped. All right. Good. What we're going to do is go to final statements now. We're going to switch the order that we started with when we pulled the names out of the official newsroom. Kuzki, we started with Bill Keating, then we went to Bill Cimbrello, so now a one-minute close. Go to Bill Cimbrello, and then we'll go to Bill Keating here. We've talked uh, about a lot of issues today, and I want to close by reminding those who are listening about the choice that they have on this Tuesday, September 4th. Unlike Mr. Keating, I'm not a professional politician. My parents immigrated to this country from Argentina when I was five years old, and they worked multiple jobs, and within six years, they were able to buy a house. This is not the reality we live in today. People are hurting across the district, across the state, and around the nation. We are here today because of the failed policies of our past, the policies of the status quo. This election isn't about Bill Cimbrello, and it's not about Bill Keating. It's about whether we, as a people, want to continue down the road that delivered us Donald Trump, a nation that is an environmental crisis, and an entire generation bur burdened by a $1.5 trillion of student debt. Or do we as a people want to fight for the nation we know we can be, a nation in which health care, housing, education are a human right, a nation that says to the richest people in the world that their greed is not as important as our dignity. That is the vision that we have been fighting for, and that is the vision that is on this ballot this Tuesday. Thank you for all your time, and it's, it would be my honor to uh, ask for your vote. Thank you very much. That was a closing statement with Bill Sombrello, and let's go to a closing statement with Bill Keating. Well, Christine, thank you, and, and thank our, our questioners uh, here today. And thank you also for, during the course of the year, 
uh, in office, uh, allowing time to discuss issues and calling up. And I want to thank uh, you and WATD for that. Uh, that's important. Uh, this is the most important election we're going to have, at least in my lifetime. And, and we can't do it alone. Uh, all levers of government are in the Republican hands, and frankly, they have failed dealing with that. We need a check on the system. We need solutions going forward. What excites me is what I've seen in the activism of people as in this district. Uh, it's extraordinary. Never saw anything like that either in my lifetime. We've got a chance in a few weeks to change it. I think it's going to happen, and I think we'll have an engaged uh, populace going forward, uh, and we're going to help change this agenda and get things done. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a candidate's forum here in the 9th Congressional District. In, uh, incumbent Democrat Bill Keating, his challenger Bill Sombrello. This entire forum up on the WATD website. And of course, you can also uh, listen online, 959WATD.com. Thank you very much, Whitman Hanson Community Access. We'll have that. This will be put up statewide. Thank you to Charles Mathewson and Monday Night Talk host Kevin Tachi for helping me host it. We will have reporters assigned to all the candidates on primary night. So listen here to WATD starting at 7 o'clock for our pregame show. Get out and vote. Remember, if you don't vote, you don't have a voice. I'm Christine James. Thanks for listening. 959-WATD. The South Shore's breaking news, weather and traffic station. WATD-FM Marshfield.